Okay, Russ, thanks so much for doing this, man. Bloody hell. Okay, first of all, Russ, again, thank you for doing this really, uh, truly. I love it every single time. Um, today, this episode, I call it Nepotism Number One with <laughs> Russ Willett. <laughs> and um, what I want to do is I want to I want to have a fair critique, which I always do with you all the time. You always give me a fair critique. And uh, besides you being uh, the, 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 the king blender of the world and having flowers thrown at you, this and that, you're pretty, uh, you're pretty a humble guy, you know? And uh, I want to say that I was researching blends by Russ Willett. And I was never so disappointed in my life. Because you have well over a hundred commercial blends. And I would say, am I right in saying that at least a hundred of those commercial blends, a hundred of them are still available? Yeah, somewhere around that, yeah. So what color is your Lamborghini? Um it is invisible. Wow. You're that wealthy, man. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. People people see me going uh, across I-90, and it looks like I'm just floating. <laughs> Holy moly. Uh, uh, Russ, the reason why I said I'm disappointed is because I'd love to try, hint, hint, I'd love to try all your tobaccos. But I don't think I have a lifetime left of me to try all these tobaccos. And I'm flipped out that the variety of people that come to you and um, ask you for your expertise, which is, which is pretty wicked, man. I mean, you're the man. You're, you're Mr. Blended. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I've been lucky to work with some really great people in the industry. Look at you. Look at you being humble. They're lucky. Jesus Christ. I mean, uh, you know, I've, I've been able to do things with Mark Ryan. I've been able to do lots of things with Sutliff. Um, you know, and and uh, I've... Uh, I've had my hand in a few different things. Uh, uh, there are a number of the blends that are out there that people probably don't even know I was involved in. Which is I, I didn't know you were involved in some of the blends that we're going to discuss today. As a matter of fact, usually this show is called Five Blends, but I couldn't help it. I mean, choosing five blends out of what you've done is just it's 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 the hardest thing to do so i've chosen six blends i hope you don't mind not at all okay so you know i want to start with one that took me by surprise because it's known as the tobacco that's going to knock you down on your ass and i guess my my tolerance is quite high and i was happy about that it didn't knock me down on my ass and uh it was a great surprise to me, especially last year. Let's say we take the surprises of last year because I always have to make an episode for something. So the surprises of last year for me was War Horse Green. I know we've talked about this. I know you've said this is an old, old, old blend and you couldn't get some uh, ingredients that were harmful to your health uh, back then. But who knew that smoking kills back then? <laughs> Because it surely doesn't kill now. <laughs> and no. uh, so I had to write down on this uh, wicked piece of paper that I got from the CIA and Elon Musk. And these are the questions they asked me to ask you. So first of all, War Horse Green plug pipe tobacco. My first question, who hired you? There were, there was a group of people. Um not a lot of people involved. And what they did was they scoured um, the internet, basically, to find out what old popular 
pipe tobacco brands had their trademarks abandoned. And they identified a bunch of them. And one of them was an Irish tobacco called Warhorse. And um, it was prim it was a uh, a bar, a plug, and they were they were rather small. Um, they were they were short and thick, and they were so hard that you really kind of had to shave them more than you could slice them. Anyway, um, they acquired the trademark and then they acquired some samples of the original and they sold they sent one off to an israeli company that analyzes the contents and there was some stuff in there that um you couldn't use today it would never be allowed i mean things like um asbestos asbestos rocket, asbestos rocket fuel um no not those things going? those you things weren't involved but but there there were some things that immediately upon seeing it i knew they weren't going to allow us to use today so i had to modify the blend but um it's a pretty hardy blend. It's 45% dark fire, 45% dark burly, and 10% red Virginia just to keep it from getting too sour. And, uh, and then we use a uh, pretty significant top dressing so that uh, it wouldn't basically cause people walking past you to curl up into a ball and die. I, I mean, it just that, that, that sounds like a recipe for disaster. Sounds like something in World War II that you would do to, to feed your enemies to kill them. Well, you you know the blend is pretty much the same kind of blend that's in um, the Italian Toscano cigars. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> the blend is pretty much the same. But the problem is. There is a reason for one of the nicknames of those cigars. In the U.S., those cigars have the nickname, and there's a pejorative term here. They're called guinea stinkers. <laughs> but and I, but I, enjoy, I, I enjoy I love them. them. I have a good I, Toscano. It's very nice. I, I love them. I love them. But you would have to admit, as I do, they're not the best smelling cigar in the world. Ah. Maybe to us, but to a non-smoker, it, it's going to be a, a pretty foul smell. So is this what War Horse smells like to other people? That's what it would smell like if I didn't put the top dressing on it. So the top dressing uh, gets rid of that heavy, funky, sour, spicy smell. It covers it up. Uh, the funny thing about it is the most common um, comparison I've gotten to the aroma of Warhorse Bar is Play-Doh. And and frankly, I, I I can't say I disagree. It really does kind of have a play doh like smell. I love it. I I tried it. I thought it was smooth, smooth, man. Well, that that came from a lot of hard work and and playing around and and luckily the good folks at um, at Sutliff. Uh, made a suggestion to adjust the top dressing, uh, which really helped the blend because I was getting a little stymied toward the end, and they they came up with the suggestion that that uh, accomplished what I wanted. How, how dare they? Those bastards suggest something that Russ Willett, uh puts down. 
I they, swear know, they know more about top dressings than I do. I, they I, not know I, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not a flavorings guy. You know, uh, most most of what I've done is minimally flavored. So what happens if you invite me over for supper at your house? Am I supposed to block my nose or something? What's going? You're not a flavoring guy. What's the matter with you? Uh, I'm not for adding a lot of flavorings to tobacco. You come over to my house, I guarantee you, you won't be lacking for flavor in my food. It's good to know. It's good. To I know. make I make a chili that will make your nose run. It's it's running right now. There you go. <laughs> and and all you're doing is thinking about it. <laughs> Imagine what will happen when you eat it. So why why bring back an old fart blend like this? Huh? Don't we have enough blends? Oh, sure. No, the reason that it was brought back is because the guys saw an opportunity and seized it. And and where did you get the, where did you get the uh, original uh, plug from? They they uh, scoured the internet until they found some people who had some, and they actually they came they used to come in a box I think of twenty four plugs. Uh, to sell to the retail stores, and they actually got a full box. That's unbelievable. Yeah, I still have a piece of one sitting around here somewhere. And uh, I, I, I hope Sutliff uh, compensated that person uh, richly. <laughs> okay, there's your answer. So, okay, you so you told me what's in it, Kentucky, and you said you said dark burly. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. uh, what other blends would you say that have a dark burly that we can compare it to? Well, I mean, the easiest one to compare it to is Five Brothers, because oh. that's what that's all Five Brothers is. It's dark burly cut in a shag. And is is it a hard smoke? Oh yeah, yeah. It, it, all it is is regular burly that's just been fermented for a long time. So basically, before it perked, that's what it is. It's it's yeah, it's not as aggressive a fermentation as perique, but if it, it's like what they do with cigar tobacco, um, they they take the leaf and they bale it, and then they allow the natural pressure to create heat. Mm. I got you. And, and that combination of pressure and heat also works with the fermentation going on in the leaf. The fermentation is what creates the heat. Mm. Yeah, and, go ahead. Sorry. And the, the, that's okay. The, and the tobacco becomes darker and it becomes earthier and spicier. Uh, nicotine content goes up a bit. It's funny because I I, um, I used to work on a farm, and uh, the bales of hay, when yes. you compress them, ferment. Yes. I didn't know that. And so the farmer guy says, shove your nose in that bale of hay. First of all, it smelled wonderful. Yes. And, and no, the cows love it, and I think they get a little drunk from it, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that's that's very possible. It's the conversion of the sugars in the uh, in the hay. Yeah, because my ex mother in law was a cow and she was always drunk, so I wonder if she ate hay. But anyways, that's not neither here nor there. Okay. So I um, didn't I didn't know her, so I couldn't I couldn't comment. So um, uh, who's this tobacco for? Old farts? Uh, no, no, because. There was nothing quite like it in the U.S. market or the Canadian market. Um, so what this is for are the people who either PBR, you uh, it, got it, it, It's brewed by Labatt's, okay? It's uh, different. It's not the same. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, this is for people who are looking for basically a kick in the teeth. Um, but they don't 
they don't want it to have an offensive aroma. I mean, you know, you can you can get straight dark barley or dark fired and smoke it in the pipe if you want to, but you'll probably lose some friends because they don't want to be anywhere near you while you're smoking it. Yeah, friends, who needs them? Yeah, well, Warhorse Bar and Warhorse Green have a pleasant enough aroma that you could smoke it and, and not really put people off too much um but it, it's it's a fairly potent tobacco um i for most people i recommend it for after dinner uh or later in the evening before bedtime because it it, it has enough nicotine that has a calming effect um but uh as for me um I I won't hesitate to tell you that I'll smoke a bowl on the way to work. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, it, it surprised me because I must have a high tolerance of nicotine because it didn't knock me out the way people said it would. It was just a really tasty tobacco, very top... Um, a lot of top notes, but still a heavy baseline. You know what I mean? It's just, it's, 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 it's a really, it's a wonderful tobacco. In my opinion, it's a wonderful tobacco. Thank you. Um, that's, it's, it's sort of like, um, sort of like the concept of some of the liquors that have hit the market in recent years, like, Absent. Crown, Crown Royal Apple and uh, Jim Beam Honey and stuff like that. When you're tasting it, you, you know you're drinking whiskey and you know the body is there. But that added little note kind of, kind of takes you out of the zone. And, and that's, that's what I was looking to do. Oh yeah, it's funny. I, I I don't see it that way. Uh, first of all, I won't I won't uh, drink Ron Royal Candy Apple uh, or or Jim Beam uh, uh, licorice this and that. It's just a, uh, but but I I don't see it that way, Russ. I'm sorry, I don't see it. We don't. No, see it everybody's opinion. You know, you're know. entitled. Uh, what pipe size? Um, when I when I smoke it earlier in the day. Uh, I'll smoke it in a smaller bowl. Uh, okay. But when I smoke it in the evenings, I'll smoke an average size pipe. You know, and the that's... fact that it's mostly burly, I mean, you don't have to worry about heat issues. Mm. It's a relatively cool smoke. And what about food and drink with this? Um... I would probably go beers. I would go for like a stout or a porter. Um, in in liquors or wines, definitely a heavy red that's not too sweet in wine. Uh, and in in liquors, uh, I would I would probably lean toward. A fuller-bodied Scotch, mm. something like a Laphroaig, mm. uh, and then for for other drinks, uh, black coffee. Okay, um, okay, not too complex. No. Okay, so you know what? Let's go on to <clears throat> this one, and I. I Okay, okay, you're a man about town, you're all over the place, and you're, you're Missouri Mersham Company country gentleman. Now, I was going to say, who hired you? I guess it's self-evident. And um, where did this come from, Russ? Like, why did they contact you? Why did they need to have, obviously to make more money, why did they need to have a tobacco where they are doing really good selling uh, corn cob pipes. 
Um, it goes back to about 11 years ago. And the St. Louis Pipe Show was going on. And uh, Phil Morgan, who was the GM at the time, happened to be at the show. And I had known Phil from other shows. And I got, uh, now you're covering it up. Now you're ashamed. Um, anyway, I, uh, I I ran into Phil at the show. And offhand, I just said to him, have, have you guys ever had a tobacco to go with your pipes? And Phil said, no. He said, that's funny. He said, because I started going through a lot of our old ads and the thing that struck me is that we never had a tobacco in there. I said, you want some? <laughs> and now, he why said, would you say that? What's the reason you would say something like that? Because I saw it as an opportunity for them. And I saw it as an opportunity for us because we're the distributor. Ah, so I put together a number of blends. I sent them out to Phil. He had their folks try them. They settled on four. We had one full aromatic, a Burley blend, a Virginia Perique blend, and then a light, slightly aromatic English blend. And, and so that's what's been out there. And Country Gentleman um, is the Virginia Perique version, but it's also got a touch of dark fired Kentucky in it. Um, it's light in, as far as uh, Virginia Periques go. Doesn't mm -hmm. have a huge amount of of Perique in it. Mm, mm -hmm. But the dark fired is there just to give it some character and body. Yeah. Russ, I sort of got it. I'm learning so much over here <clears throat> that whatever. Uh, I knew it. I knew it. This is very top note. And then you said you wanted to you wanted to hold it up with something. And so you yeah, brought in the Kentucky. Well, that's, that's, you know, that's what we call balance. Hey, if ever uh, you want to take a vacation and, and uh, the company that you work for, what, what do they call pipes and cigars? Need a, need a, you know, uh, a guy to fill in. I can help. Okay. Um, All right. So you told me what's in it. And um, who's this for? Um, this is for people... This is for people getting into Virginia Perique blends mm. because the Perique is not that heavy. Um, it's also for people who kind of like Virginia Perique blends but don't think they have enough of a base note. Mm. They don't have enough depth. Um, this does. So they could they could go in this direction, and also for people who, um, fr frankly, aren't quite sure what they want to smoke yet, because it gives them some Virginia character, some Perique, and the dark fired. It it gives them a little bit of a few different things. To where they could smoke it and go, okay, I kind of like that smokiness about it, but I didn't care much for the rest. So they know they should start looking for blends with dark fired. Or they may smoke it and say, I don't like that smokiness, but I, I like the sweetness and the spice. Well, in which case, you? they should go to straight uh, Virginia Perique blends. Will this bite you? Uh, if you smoke it hard. Okay. Okay. So it's true to a vapor then. Okay. Yes. All righty. And um, what what size pipe would you smoke this in? Um, I I would go smaller to medium chambers. 
Um, I would I would go to smaller chambers if you're not a veteran Virginia guy. Um, because the smaller chamber restricts airflow. And that'll keep the blend from getting too hot as you ah, smoke. Ah, look at that. Science is there. Yeah. Um, the, the wider the bowl is, the more oxygen you get when you puff, which is why that's good for wet aromatics. It's good for Latakia blends because both of those types of blends are hard to keep lit. So the wider chamber with more oxygen coming in will help keep the pipe lit better. Look at that, Russ. It's, it's incredible. Uh, the, opposite, the opposite is true. If you go to a narrow chamber like a 5 8 it's better for Virginia blends because restricting the airflow is going to reduce the heat. Still puffing, still puffing. Normal. Okay, okay. And um, what do you have, food and drink on this? Food and drink. Um, it, it definitely has a high level of sweetness and it has a bit of smokiness. Uh, so, uh, and it's more of a medium body blend. So you want to go something medium bodied that's not particularly sweet. Um, coffee with milk or cream would be a, a good option. Um, as far as liquors go, um, rum and gin actually go well. Look at that, huh? Rum, rum in particular, um, if you're talking about like an Añejo or a Reposado. Um, and then in terms of uh, wines, um, something a little drier, but, but not a real heavy red. Uh and then, you know, I mean, for me, uh, with a blend like that, the only thing I, I recommend against as far as pairings go, nothing with any effervescence. It's funny that you say that. Yeah, okay. I could see that. And would you say that of all Virginia-type tobaccos, effervescence, nine? No good. No good. Um, you create enough heat with and and acidity with the Virginia blends that if you were to drink something effervescent with it, it's definitely going to cause your tongue to tingle. I knew that. You know why I knew that? Because I did it. Yeah. You <laughs> only do it, and you only tend to do it once. <laughs> well, in my case, I did it a few times. Okay. Whatever. Okay, so okay, well, okay. Uh, Missouri mushroom. How many are there uh, available of Rust Blend Missouri's? Four. Mm. So there's Great Dane. That's the um, that's the uh, aromatic that's got um, Black Cavendish Burley and um, a very noticeable cherry and uh, caramel note. Okay. Then there's um, American Heritage, and that is a light English um, with a hint of bourbon. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, Country Gentleman. And then the last one is um, Missouri Pride. And that is a broken burly flake with a bit of Virginia in it. And not, not a very noticeable top dressing. Let me ask you something. You guys, Americans, try to get away from the, from, from the English so much that why do you Americans do English blends? Why don't you let the English people do English blends? Well, you know what? They're not, they're not English blends. 
that that's that's a bastard uh, bastardization of the last thirty years. The term, the term English blend used to just mean tobaccos that didn't have a significant flavoring added. That's what it used to mean. And over the last 30, 40 years, that's changed to mean Latakia blends. But that's not, in my mind, what an English blend is. To me, an English blend is more along the lines of the Gowith and Hogarth and Samuel Gowith stuff, um, especially the stuff that didn't have a really heavy top note. Like the Lakeland stuff. Yeah, but but the stuff without as much topping. To me, you know, that's the real English stuff. Um, like uh, Gowith and Hogarth... Uh, Kendall Dark. Mm. Now there's there is basically a Toscano in a pipe. I like that. It, <laughs> and it's it, funny. It, 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 it seemed like you took that 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 question personally. It seems like I ruffled a few feathers there. No, no, no. It's I I I'm just kind of upset the way that that people have changed an old term so that it means something different today because I don't like using the term English to describe a Latakia blend. You know, Greg Peace feels the same way. And he and I agree that it would be better to say Latakia blend Virginia forward because that's what the quote English blends are supposed to be. They're blends where Latakia is the dominant note. The secondary note is Virginia. A Balkan is a Latakia blend where Orientals are the secondary note. But describing it as Latakia blend Virginia forward, Latakia blend Orientals forward is more accurate. And it's easier to understand. So basically, it's Russ Willett and Greg Pease against the world. Well, uh, no, because we're going to lose. Ah, this is great, great. Ah, just having fun here, Russ. Okay, okay. This one I was surprised, man. Like, I was pleasantly surprised, Russ. Because for some reason, every tobacco I like, you're in it somehow. It's, it's, it's supposed to piss me off, but it, I like it. I don't know. I'm getting older. <laughs> and this, Russ, is, again, and I'm surprised, John Cotton's Double Pressed Virginia, which I enjoy that tobacco. I didn't want to enjoy it because of the loud yellow uh, uh, tin uh, the, 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 the picture and it's like double pressed Virginia. What the hell is double pressed Virginia? So obviously, okay. Well, no. Who hired you for this? Um, the same people that did Warhorse. Those guys at Sutler. They they also bought the John Cotton's trademark. Jesus, man. You know what I mean? I but we 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 control it now. We bought thought, it from them. I thought a monopoly was against the law in the States. No. Not of this sort. <laughs> we we probably represent all of all of the blends that I've put together definitely represent less than one percent of all the pipe tobacco in the US. Sincerely. Yeah. That's I mean incredible. look for every for every one tin of John Cotton's Double Pressed Virginia, Lane probably sells 100 pounds of 1Q. Really? Oh, yeah. 95% of the U.S. market is aromatics. Oh, uh, yeah, I know you told me that. I know. I, I don't know why I'm... It's my prejudice and my... that I, I'm disappointed at that. Why am I disappointed at that? Is, is it because I'm... Oh, a you should... Man? 
you shouldn't be uh, disappointed in that. Uh, Americans are screwed up. <laughs> um, uh, you know it, what? It what it really came down to is when you go back to the forties, fifties, sixties. There were a lot fewer aromatics. And people used to smoke on the street. They used to smoke in malls and in supermarkets. They Having used to, lunch. Yeah. Um, the confessional. I mean, they, they smoked everywhere. Yeah, the priest didn't enjoy it. But <laughs> but you could you could smoke just about everywhere. And a lot of people were put off by those old American blends, which were predominantly burly uh, and didn't have much of a top note, and they they found them stinky. Yeah. Okay. So, going into the '60s, companies started producing more aromatics, um, so that people could smoke in public and other people wouldn't be offended by the aroma. Even in California. He, uh, we don't talk about California. As far as tobacco is concerned, uh, California isn't even in the U.S. Uh, oh. um, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, that, that was the idea. And as time went along and more of the older pipe smokers who used to smoke those less pleasant smelling blends go, they started quitting or passing away and everything. And the newer generation of pipe smokers wanted to capitulate to the other people. So they started smoking more aromatics and now it's kind of the default. Now the whole world smells like cherries. No, yeah, it 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 can if it wants to. Yeah, I've got plenty of cherry flavored tobacco to sell them. Okay, well, I mean, you know, that's what it is. It's a business. Now I'm going to ask a stupid question. I don't even know if this is a stupid question, but in John Cotton's Double Press in Virginia, what's in it? <laughs> yeah, that really is a stupid question. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay, so it's, I it's, Virginia. it's Virginia with a mellow top note. Uh, it's you know, pressed. It's pressed into a flake originally, and then the flakes are mechanically separated, like like chicken and pork. Yeah, they don't. They don't have people sitting there rubbing out the flakes. Yeah. They they put it into a tumbler and the and the tumbler breaks the the flakes apart. I see. And then that tobacco is allowed to catch oxygen for a couple of months because whenever you whenever you press tobacco or you put it in a tin and you open that fresh tin, if they're Virginia based. To get the, the real flavor of the tobacco, you have to leave that tin open for at least 24 hours. Really? Have you ever noticed that you've opened a, a tin of a Virginia Flake or a Virginia Perique Flake, and you smoke a bowl right away, and then you go back a week later and you smoke another bowl? The second bowl seems to taste better. Mm, okay, okay, okay. I've noticed that, yeah, a few times. Yep. Okay, well, that's because that period after you open the tin is time for the tobacco to reoxygenate, and that enlivens the flavor. So are you saying that basically all flake tobaccos need to be rubbed out and let let breathe let no, no, just let it. You can let it breathe in flake form. 
but you got to you got to let oxygen get in there. But if you, and, if you rub it, don't you let it breathe a bit better? Uh, you know. Well, it, it, and if you prefer to smoke tobaccos as a ribbon cut, then yeah, sure, go ahead and do that. Uh, but a lot of people like to fold in stuff or whatever with flakes. So it's not necessary. Um, but if you prefer to have your tobaccos as a ribbon cut, then sure, go ahead and rub out a few flakes and let them sit out uh, to, to oxygenate. Um, but, you know, when it's pressed originally, um, there's a fermentation that goes on, but you're driving oxygen away because of the pressure you know air can't get mm. into the flake mm. so that's why after it's tumbled it sits for a couple of months and the oxygen gets a chance to get back into the leaf and then that rubbed out tobacco is moved back into a press and put under pressure and what I tell people when they're talking about John Cotton's Double Press Virginia, which won the Chicago Bowl for Virginia Flakes in 2019. In fact, over my shoulder, you can see the bowl on my shelf. That, wow. was, that was the prize. Um, How come Sutliff didn't keep it? Well, because we own the John Cotton's brand, not Sutliff. It's our brand. Oh. They may they may do the manufacturing. Capisce. But we but we own the brand. Okay. And I describe John Cotton's double press Virginia as the Virginia for people who don't like Virginias. Because people have, people have the thought in their mind that a Virginia is going to smoke hot. Mm. It's going to sting. And that it's going to have a sharp sweetness to it. But the second pressing takes a lot of the heat issues away. It takes some of the acidity away. And it also mellows down the sharpness of the blend. But it, a Virginia, in essence, as it's breathing and aging, creates more sugar, no? No. No, it, it creates a depth of flavor. So it goes from being like candy to being more like dried fruit mm, okay I, I, that's good i like that it's you know it's, it's gonna give you more prune raisin type of notes hmm and that's that's from fermentation it's funny speaking to you concerning all these tobaccos like i wanted to smoke a war horse tonight but now i want to smoke a john cotton's tonight so you're, you're you're screwing me up, Russ. Uh, That's okay. We got a couple more to do, so I can screw you up further. Okay, what pop size? And who's it? Oh yeah, okay. What pop size? Yeah, definitely a smaller chamber is better for this. And food and drink. Food and drink again. Stay away from anything effervescent. Um, a, a dry white wine mm. works better here because. It body wise, it's a, a light tobacco. Um, and again, gin would be a good choice. A, a gin and tonic, if you let some of the bubbles out, if you let some of the bubbles out, a gin and tonic would be fine. Or a martini. Oh, martini well, like would martini. go up. I like a martini. I like yeah. a few martinis, as a matter of fact. Okay. Um, well, I'll tell you what. I'll bring the olives. 
<laughs> okay, okay, so that's it for John Cotton. And uh, yeah, you, you were involved in John Cotton. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> well, when I hear Hearth and Home, your face is there for some reason, all the time. And now there are so many blends in Hearth and Home that I want to try. Hint, hint. And um, this one is called, and I, I, I like it because there's, a, there's an Americana football uh, rah, 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 uh, uh, awe and shock thing about it. And it's called Strike Force. Yeah. Who named it? Uh, it was named for the person I created the blend for. He owns a company called Strike Force, which oh. is a security company. I thought it was more romantic than that, for God's sake. Uh, no, uh, and he likes heavy Latakia blends, but he also likes them with a little punch to them. So, so well, this this blend is very Latakia forward, but it also has some stronger tobaccos under the surface. Uh, you don't um, notice them so much because of the amount of Latakia. But but Hearth and Home, is this your baby? This is your... I created Hearth and Home in 2004. There you go. Um, I started out with six blends, which are now part of the signature series. Right. We tried them with uh, members of the Pipe Club at the Brick and Mortar. And when they liked them, we put them on sale in the brick and mortar, and they took off. So that's when the previous owner said, let's put them on pipes and cigars. We did, and they took off. And uh, we went from 200 pounds of tobacco made the first year, and within five years, we were up to around 10,000 pounds. Sounds like my uh, my ex mother in law, but um, I even I even designed the the logo. I, I didn't know you uh, you 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 dabbled in uh, in uh, what do you call that thing? Uh, graphic arts, Gra graphic design. Um, it, it actually was just playing around with the font, but um, it worked. It worked, and. Uh, you know, we stuck with it. I mean, we came down here to Pennsylvania and we've got a whole team of graphic artists who are incredibly talented. And they took a look at it and nobody suggested changing it. So we we stayed with it. Jesus, you're a renaissance man. What's next? You're going to tell me you're a musician too? <laughs> For uh, but yeah, yeah, you see right over there. Uh, that, that's why I had that in my mind. Yeah. Uh, so who hired you for your company? Uh, I was hired by the owner of the company at the time. Which was you, no? No. Uh, yeah, but I'm I've, never, I've never owned any part of this. I don't own Hearth and Home. I never owned Pipes and Cigars. I've never been a manager. I'm just what a grunt. Waiting? What are you waiting for, Russ? For God's sakes, man! I could be your, I could be your, 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 your agent. You know, I, I, I can make you live better. For God. Yeah, sakes. yeah. Well, we'll, uh, we'll see about that. I, I'm at an age where a lot of people are retired. I really don't know that I want to get involved in uh, starting up anything uh, at this point in my life, because. Yeah. I'm the kind I'm the kind of person that if I get into something, I dive in. You know, I'm I'm in both feet. Uh, you know, and and so if I were if I were to try something like that, I'd be spending 80 hours a week again. I don't I don't want that anymore. You know, I used to work in a psychiatric institute. I used to work with a lot of retired people. Um so uh well what's in it? Tobacco. You said Latakia. Yes. Latakia, Latakia, some Orientals, a, a bit of dark barley, a bit of Virginia, and a touch of Perique. 
dare I say it's an English blend. Yeah, you, you can call it whatever you want. Call it Fred. I don't care. Uh, okay, so who's this for? Uh, this is for people who, who really like Latakia forward blends. Right. But they, but who also like to have a little kick to it, a little spice, because it definitely has some. And that's where your perique comes in. Yeah, uh, the perique and also the burly. Burly kind of amps it up a bit. All right. Uh, what pipe size would this? C can I guess? Can I guess? Go ahead. Medium. Medium to large. Look at that. <laughs> Take a vacation, Russ. I swear I could fill in. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, drink. Hold on. <laughs> All right. I'm on vacation. Oh, God. Uh, food and drink, Russ. Um, yeah, definitely heavy here. This is a great one for uh, port. Really? A, a ruby port would just absolutely go incredibly well mm. because it's not a particularly sweet blend but it's very full-bodied and port is full-bodied but it is sweet so you've got contrasting flavors but similar body and on top of that uh port just has this mellow warming sense as you drink it which goes beautifully with that cr rich, creamy smoke that you get from a blend like this. Okay, so so I'm not looking for high notes in this blend. No, don't don't expect any. Okay. Yeah, this is this is something that would go perfect with one of my favorite, more affordable ports, which would be Where's LBV. LBV stands for low body. No. No. So far, you're you're o for two. LBV stands for late bottled vintage. That's what I meant to say. Yes, of course. <clears throat> and and if anybody's looking for where's is spelled W A R R E apostrophe S. I, I knew that. Okay, Russ, I didn't know you were a um, Civil War fan. You know, and I'm, I mean, you're living in Pennsylvania, didn't you? Or aren't you? I am. So, I mean, I mean, the crux of everything happened there, didn't it? Yeah, well, Gettysburg is, you know, a few hours from here. I, I, I got to visit Gettysburg. Probably cry a lot, you know, anyways. So, I didn't know you were a Civil War fan. And I'm talking about Brigadier's Black. Sherman's March. Okay. So what the hell, Russ? I didn't have anything to do with the Brigadier Black Line. Other than helping choose the blends. There you go. Come on. Helping choose the blends. Like that's nothing here. What do you say? Well, I didn't actually blend them. I just helped choose them. How do you help choose a blend? What you help the person pick up the blend of, of Virginia and put it down? Uh, I don't no, get it. we discuss we discuss what names are going to be used and what blends will work well with it. And so that's where I came up with you know the the different blends, but uh, you know I didn't have anything to do with designing any of the art i didn't have anything to do with physically blending the tobaccos this was this was kind of uh kind of a fortunate accident um the folks at at sutliff uh went uh came to us with a limited edition they only wanted to um, to do four blends in cans, and they would produce this run, and that was going to be it. We sold through it really quick. People started yelling, <laughs> "Why can't we get this anymore? <laughs> why why did you stop making it?" So we went back. 
to Sutliff and we asked them if they could produce them again. And they did. Um, and then about five, six years ago, uh, we decided to add two, which Sherman's March is one of those two. And, um, and we chose to go with a very old fashioned American style blend, which is primarily maple top note. Uh, with with mostly Virginia and Burley, which, you know, I mean, there were a lot of blends like that in the 50s and, and before that had maple. Let, let, let me stop you for a second here. What the hell do Americans know about maple? I'm Canadian here. What are you, serious? Hey, guys, up. <laughs> what are you, serious? I originally came from New York State. New York State produces some pretty damn good maple syrup. And ah, so, does, but, uh, so does Vermont. So does New Hampshire. Oh, for God's sakes. That was all French colonies beforehand. Look, I'm telling you something. Yeah, and we kicked you guys out. Okay, let's, let's, let's okay. Uh, what pipe size for this, for God's sake? Uh, medium to, to larger. And who's it for? Uh, the person who likes codger blends. Codger blends, eh? We're yeah. We're going to have to do something about codger blends because I think they get a bad rap. Oh, I, look. I I smoke Sir Walter Raleigh on, on a regular basis or, or uh, Velvet. I mean, I have nothing against codger blends. Uh, if, if people look down their nose at them, it's only because... They have more money than they have brains. Man, you know, you, you probably got nothing. Uh, you have nothing bad to say about them because you probably get ten cents on every dollar of every package sold. But anyway, nope. let's not talk about that. Nope. <laughs> no, nope, I get a paycheck every two weeks. Yeah. That's it. And you know what? I'm looking at, at at the picture of Sherman's March, and I think Atlanta is burning. What, what, what are you guys? Uh, 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 they put it out a long time ago. It's fine now. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Oh, I was I was down there a few years ago and I can tell you that <laughs> I didn't see any smoke at all. Okay. And uh Russ, last but not least, I'm going back to Hearth and Home. <laughs> And uh, I chose this because of the name, just like the batshit tobacco, which which is uh, no 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 the horseshit horseshit tobacco, which is Mer de Cheval, right? Which which you know what it's 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 a nice blend. I like it. it again, it's it's another over the counter codger type blend, and very pleasant. I I had no problem with it. I thought it was more astute than that. I thought it was more, you know, black tie, and now I'm I'm smoking Codger blends. See, I got the pressure. No, I mean those that blends. that blend that blend was originally made in the early 1900s. Oh yeah, okay, I read about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's not talk about that. Let's okay. Let's talk about Frenzy, Frenchy's sons of bitches. <laughs> Holy cow! You get, you have to try these tobaccos because of the name. Now, yep. um, who hired you? Well, again, this is Hearth and Home, so nobody hired me. It's my brand. Um, and, uh, and who chose the name? <laughs> I I did. There was a guy who sold the state pipes, whose <laughs> nickname was Frenchy. And he, his website was Frenchie's Pipes. <sighs> and Frenchie had certain loves. And his loves were Burley, Perique, and Bourbon. <sighs> and so I said to him, well, now that you told me that, I'm going to have to come up with a blend for you. And so I made a Burley Virginia blend with some Perique, mm -hmm. 
and a top note of really nice bourbon. Okay. <laughs> and I sent it off to him, and he tried it, and he went nuts. He's telling everybody about the blend. Well, Frenchie, Frenchie lived down south, <sighs> Tennessee, I believe. But he, um, he was a native New Yorker. He moved down south after he was in the, the military. <laughs> and and because of coming from Brooklyn, he always would say things like, ah, you sons of bitches. <laughs> so when it came time to name the blend, the first thing that popped well, into my head is Frenchie's <laughs> sons of bitches. Obviously. <laughs> And did he enjoy the, 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 <laughs> oh, geez. And what, what's a Frenchman doing in Brooklyn? Uh, actually, he was <clears throat> Italian. But his last name was close to sounding like Frenchy. <laughs> so people bastardized his last name from being an obviously Italian last name to calling him Frenchie. Is this man still alive? I don't believe so. I think he I'd passed. love to meet him. I'd love to meet him. <laughs> oh, he, he, was, he was a fun guy to talk to. So uh, what's in it? It's Burley with some Virginia, some Perique, and um, a bourbon top note. Oh, yeah, you told me that before. Steve. Yeah, very, very high-quality bourbon top note, though. Who is it for? Um, people who like slightly aromatic blends. Um, people who want uh, some Perique, but they don't want it to hit them over the head. Uh, and people who like burly blends. Is this a signature blend? Yes. What pipe size, uh, Russ? Um, I would probably just stick with medium all the way with these. And the food and drink with this? Um, this would be a good one with a lager beer or maybe an IPA. Oh, okay. Um, it would be fine with pretty much any whiskey. Okay. Um, in terms of wines, uh, a lighter dry red uh, or maybe a rosé. Now what about people like me who are more highfalutin than a lot of other people who like caviar and champagne? Would that go well? Uh, yes, yeah, champagne would. Well, to me, champagne is the universal pairing. Champagne will go with anything. And the reason I say that is champagne has all the elements of palate cleansing that you can get in a drink. But what about Virginia? It's got the little bubbles. Yeah, well, again, flavor-wise, it, it, it's going to work. Okay. It's a palate cleanser because there are three things in my experience that will cleanse your tongue when you're smoking. Number one is alcohol because alcohol will dissolve some of the oils so it keeps your palate fresh another thing that will do it is tannins that's why tea and coffee work well oh, okay. when you're smoking because there are tannins in those and the tannins are astringent so they help to cleanse your palate 
And then the third thing is effervescence. Anything that's bubbly will help cleanse your palate. That's why with a lot of the, the heavier foods that are now prevalent in the U.S., um, they, they always serve sodas. You know, if you sit down for a pizza and it's not a full-blown restaurant, you're probably going to have soda with it. Mm. And it's because the effervescence cuts through the fat of the cheese on the pizza. Mm, mm. It'll it'll cut through the fat from the the fryer for French fries or a burger that's you know got like seventy three twenty seven uh, beef. You know you need something to to cut th through the fat. Well, effervescence does it there. It also helps to cleanse your tongue. I'll tell you something. Uh, when I was young and I would swear a lot, something else would cleanse my tongue. My mother did it to me very often. and that's yeah. So yeah, and you probably had, uh, had the runs for a couple of days afterwards. But, um, but the, reason, the reason champagne works really well is because it has all three of those elements. It's effervescent. It has tannins and it has alcohol. So the combination of the three means that champagne will really cleanse your palate well. Now, that doesn't mean strictly champagne. No, I got you. I got you. You're you know, any sparkling. dry, any dry sparkling, sparkling wine. wine, a mm. Prosecco will do fine. You know, you know, I just had an epiphany over here. The reason why I like Lakeland's. It's because my mother used to wash out my mouth with soap. There you go. Especially yeah. if it was especially if it was ivory. <laughs> ivory yes. soap is the Lakelands of uh, bar soaps. Well, you know, what can I say? Every time I walk into the dollar store and I see that ivory soap, I'm like, I'm loving it. But anyways, yep. Russ, you're the best. Uh, it's unbelievable how much fun I have. Uh, I wanted to go take a nap now, but I can't because the adrenaline's pumping in my brains. Plus, I think I'm going to have to open another uh, Pabst. Uh, look, I bought it because it was on sale, okay? Okay? I, it's, it's okay. There's nothing wrong with PBR. I, yes, there is. <laughs> no. I, I, look, I, I am definitely the anti-snob. Okay? I do... I do like finer things, but that doesn't mean I can't find the value in less expensive things. Is that so, what you talk to me because I'm a finer thing? Less, so I'll, I'll enjoy, if I get an opportunity to have one, I'll enjoy a Schwatten double Bach. But for the most part, I'm going to drink Michelob Ultra. I get a headache, man. It gives me a headache. Well, it's it's about the only beer I can have anymore. You know, I prefer the other one you said, that the Scheiser Double Bock. Spotten. Spotten. Sorry. Sorry, my German is not up the... Up the yeah. Up the it, it's about the color of Scheiser, but, um, <laughs> but that's not the brand name. No, I, I don't. I, I don't believe in snobbishness. I, I can I can be just as happy loading a bowl of of uh, Sir Walter Raleigh or lighting up a Parodi cigar or a De Nobili, which are Toscanos. Yeah, yeah, but that's upper crust. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, I I I don't. I'm I'm not a snob, as and even when it comes to pipe tobacco and cigars, I'm not. God, yeah, you're, not like I, Dav you're not like Davidoff then. I, I look, I love Davidoff cigars. Of course, there's there's something unique about the way that they they ferment their tobacco. It has a flavor that's unlike anything else that's out there. I love them. 
I'm not going to spend that kind of money on a regular basis. I'm I'm a blue collar guy. I am not, you know, I, I I don't have a ton of money, and that being the case, my tastes run more to the center. Um, do I like the the more expensive stuff? Sure, but it has to be in measured doses. I can't. I, I can't smoke happen? a Padron all the time. What's going to happen when King Charles invites you over for an OBE, man? Well, <laughs> it's going to it's gonna have to be with me wearing a Hawaiian shirt to the ceremony. <laughs> I, don't if, know if he, he, I don't know if he would get the humor in that. <laughs> if, he won't, if he won't accept my Hawaiian shirt with flamingos on it, then the deal is off. I'm okay. I'm not I'm not going to accept it. So my, my my head hurts, my teeth hurt, my guts are hurting. Uh, stop it, please. <laughs> Russ, thank you so much for doing this. Oh my God! And um, again, I'm learning so much. And what I've learned today is that I can't afford all your tobaccos. I can't afford to try all your tobaccos because you're basically the blender of everybody, for God's sakes, man. No, that's that's not hardly the case. But look, sometime I'll come up and visit you, and I'll I'll come up with a high cube truck, and I'll I'll load the back up for you. I like that. I like that. <laughs> Anyways, Russ, thanks again. And um, we're obviously going to do this again because I love this, 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 this. I love this, whatever. It's whatever this is, I love it. So thanks, Russ. You're welcome. Now, I'm going to ask a stupid question. I don't even know if this is a stupid question, but in John Cotton's Double Press in Virginia, what's in it? <laughs> yeah, that really is a stupid question. <laughs> <laughs>